Uh, morning, all. Uh, morning, Owen, Chris, Paul. Yeah, morning to you. Sun is shining. It is. It's shining here. Um, has been pretty wet, especially if you've been up in Angus, uh, Stenhaven, Brecon. I know that area. Gosh, it can be wet up there, but that is proper wet. Uh, anyway, if, uh, I hope none of you are suffering the consequences of flooding or anything horrible like that. Morning to you, Chris. Melanie, uh, morning. Hi there. Uh, so, yeah, I, well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting when Stuart says that the indices have suffered um, a lot um, last week, and they have, but what's actually interesting is that how little the indices or stock markets, generally global stock markets, have reacted to what's happening in the Middle East, bearing in mind all the dire sort of statements about Third World War, all the despots in China and North Korea, Russia, uh, Iran, Syria, and, and here we are, you know, the markets, yeah, well, they're not, they're not, they're not collapsing, are they? Well, they're not shining, but they're not collapsing. But I, what I mean is, you know, you can get a 10, 15% fall in markets. We're only back down to levels we were at the beginning of October, after all. Um, it's not like it's um, um, a route. Uh, anyway, uh, another tough week, as Stuart was saying, for global markets. All major indices uh, fell in response to this escalating conflict between Israel and the uh, uh, Hamas uh, terrorist group, as they're called. Um, obviously, gold, which is a, sort of a bit of a lightning rod for all that um, geopolitical, global, macro stuff, um, continues to rally, um, along with a further rise in sovereign bond yields, which um, actually is not something you'd expect if indeed there was a, a big geopolitical global macro deal uh, because uh, you'd expect there to be a rush into bonds and that's certainly not happening uh, anyway 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 so um, well it's the uncertainty isn't it we, we don't know what's going to be happening next um, there are aid trucks apparently they've allowed a second convoy in um, the UN estimates that they're going to need hundreds of trucks of aid not 20 or 40 or however many have gone in um, to alleviate the significant um, suffering that's happening there. Um, and just looking at the news over the weekend, I was just looking at the BBC. They were saying that uh, um, Israel has struck some sites in, in Lebanon. Um, Anyway, I, I, I read about uh, some of them. They, um, yeah, 14 aid trucks arrived on Sunday and another convoy has gone in overnight. I mean, it's just not enough. Um, do you trade, people trade the bond markets? Absolutely they do, Owen. I, I, I think the problem with the bond markets is that it, not, not everyone understands them, uh, the way that the price uh, trades inversely proportional to the yield, uh, and they can be absolutely dead. Uh, not so, not dead at the moment. There's been some significant moves. Um, I trade them on markets, but partly through uh, my own investing as well. Um, and you can get some great returns um, on on um, bonds, sovereign bonds especially, uh, that are particularly safe. Um, but there's been some big moves. I'll get on to that in a second, actually. But uh, in answer to your question, yet the U.S. Treasury market, the, the U.S. sovereign bond market, is absolutely huge. Every single fund manager anywhere in the world will have some exposure to it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, so th this war, uh, no signs at all of uh, this war abating whatsoever. And that's despite who have we had out there now? I think Schultz from Germany. Biden from the US, Sunak from here in the UK. I think Macron's going out this week. I don't know what the purpose is. I think uh, world diplomats like to see if they can try and help the situation, um, of showing their support for Israel on the one hand, but also looking to prevent an escalation of the conflict because it's going to affect all of us if oil goes to $120 or something. Um, and when I talk about an escalation, obviously, uh, with this larger Hezbollah terrorist group, which is based in southern Lebanon and is um, 
financed by um, Iran largely. Um, anyway, yeah, so those convoys, I don't know what the effect will be. It it's, hasn't really helped the markets now. They, they, were, they were a little bit firmer than where they are now, but we've seen a bit of a sell-off in the S&Ps uh, just over the, yeah, there's been quite a sell-off. Um, I know, uh, you, you know, these developments are going to happen all the time, and to keep abreast of everything that's been reported from the Middle East is almost impossible. But all I would say is this is sort of typical of the uncertainty around um, a, a global macro geopolitical event. We, we, we just have to get used to the increase in volatility, really. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, all those... Um, world leaders um, not having much effect but they've got to do their best and let's face it war is normally sorted out by people talking uh, and negotiating uh, and that's what this is all about and certainly I think everyone was expecting Israel to just wade in um, a week ago um, or even earlier but there's been a little bit more head scratching and hopefully some um, some sense coming into the negotiations but uh, gosh the the flattening of Gaza is just horrific. You've got to wonder what, what the consequences will be. You've got 2.1 million people without a, a roof over their heads. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, the equity markets, I think, as I said, I don't think it does reflect the potential for war um, in Gaza to escalate significantly. I think there was this um, an interesting article by um, uh, a chap called Rushir Sharma, who... Uh, writes for the FT, he's a, he's a fund manager, uh, quite a bright guy, um, and he suggests that equity markets have likely created uh, um, um, a, a sort of, uh, how can I put it, uh, they're, they're, they're hardened, uh, he's saying that um, equity markets are sort of hardened to the um, global macro events such as this war uh, between Israel and the Hamas terrorist group, and it it tends to be overplayed in the markets and the effect, the effects can actually be reversed quite quickly. And he uses the example of um, the 12% fall in the US markets after the, um, following the 9-11 um, uh, outrage, uh, because that was actually reversed by October the 11th, so literally a month later. And he makes the point that the dire threats and dire consequences of, an, of a geopolitical event are often ever present but rarely come to pass. So geopolitical events such as this conflict obviously create serious concern and worry for the global economy. And we're all on it and we're all reacting to all the, you know, social media posts. If I had any, yeah, I'm only Instagram, I don't do Facebook or Twitter, but that's tend to what's happened. So information spreads very, very quickly. Um, but the markets, I, I'd say, are implying that the consequences will not be that significant. That's the markets. That doesn't talk about human suffering or anything else. Anyway, to under, underline, uh, sorry, underline, underline that, um, oh, and you were talking about do people trade the bond markets, we can have a quick look at the um, bond markets I showed at the beginning of my first screen. And here we've got the United States telling us what the yield is on various durations, and I'm hovering over the 10-year yield. And a month ago, the 10-year yield was 4.41%. So that's what you'd have got. If you bought a US 10-year bond, you'd have got a yield of 4.41% uh, per annum to maturity. And a week ago, it was 4.41%. Now, it's 4.98%. The point I'm making is that yields have not come off, i.e. the bond markets haven't rallied, uh, they've gone in the opposite direction, which does not suggest there's much in the way of a flight to quality or a flight to safety into US Treasuries. At least that's what I'm reading into it anyway. Uh, so, um, yeah, yeah, so it's uh, hardly a flight to quality. Yeah, absolutely. Not not, not what you, do, you would expect. Um, so there were some positive bits of news last week. Um, China uh, released its um, uh, GDP data, came in at 4.9%. percent of a quick look at that. I'll remind myself, I've written down 4.9%, but was it 4.9? Yeah, yeah, it is, 4.9%. So 4.9%, better, 
better than expected, 4.5%. Um, you always wonder whether there's actually, is it concocted? It comes out from the state um, uh, department, uh, and they always tend to either hit or beat their forecast. Um, Melanie, um, what's the view on the drop in house prices here in the UK? Do you think the prices will go up, go back up soon? Melanie, really interesting question. Um, some a question that uh, my da two daughters have asked me, who uh, both want to buy a property um, and then trying to work out what they can afford, and they don't want to be the end on the end of a um, a, a prolonged route in property prices. But I, I think what I would say, Melanie, a lot of Oh, you've got one to sell. Yeah. Um, gosh, yeah, I'm not a, I, I hate to advise anyone on this, but all, all, all I would say is that as far as property is concerned, for anyone that's looking to buy, it's an asset that you're going to live in. So it's actually got a lot of use. It's not just like owning a bar of gold. Um, I, I think there's going to be a sweet swap spot when it is time to sell, Melanie, um, when interest rates have peaked. Have they peaked? We're not sure. We'll have to wait and see what the Bank of England have got to say at the beginning of November. Um, but remember, the, the house prices are not as fluid as the price of a, of a share traded on the stock market. You know, you can have a, a buyer's market, which it is at the moment as property prices are falling. And there are buyers. You know, there are buyers coming out. A lot of people who can't afford rent. You know, the rent of a one, for a one-bed property is over £2,000 a month now in London. You know, a lot of people are thinking, I can get a mortgage for that pay that and that tends to be what happening especially couples you know girlfriend boyfriend who want to live together um, it's a lot cheaper and that's something uh, my middle daughter's contemplating uh, Bailey is talking about one more increase yeah it's interesting you say that um, but he also said over the weekend that um, he thought um, inflation was going to come down quite sharply and I, I I just don't know I I think the jury's out on this one um, Owen a great time for buyers. Yeah, it's a buyer's market. I, it's a great time for buyers. But I mean, property prices, for example, in London, I know a lot of a lot of areas of London, they peaked in 2014. They've not been back since. So it's one of those things that attracts a lot of speculation. And the tax regime and everything else was really in favor of landlords. And you've got a lot of people just buying property instead of putting money into a pension. And now they're on the other end of it. Um, a friend of mine who's a letting agent for Foxton's in London said that some of um, their clients have seen that, that that's landlords, that is, who, who let through Foxton's, have seen um, their um, interest rates, uh, the cost of their borrowing increase by threefold. And that's just something they just can't pass on those costs to uh, tenants. They can, they can try, and there's been a record increase in, um, in rental uh, costs, but... Uh, that's still not covering it. And that's why a lot of landlords are selling. And that's, Melanie, that's one of the reasons why you're probably fighting with them, I'm afraid. Uh, inflation is buoyed by oil prices, which are going up. Owen, interesting you say that. Actually, this time last year or 30 months ago, oil prices had spiked. Uh, and um, that's one of the reasons why we're expecting inflation to fall. And that was a point that um, apparently Andrew Bailey made at a, in an article uh, in the Telegraph, and he said that that particular data is the base effect that's falling out of the annual calculation, and that's the reason why inflation is going to fall. Uh, in London, and never really fallen back, rents in North London are extraordinary. Paul, that's really interesting. Yeah, I've got a daughter that lives on um, Belsize Park. Uh, she's got such a good deal, but she's frightened. The, the landlord's talked about putting it up 35% mainly because he hasn't put up uh, the rental charges whilst she's been there for the last two and two and a half, three years. Yeah. Uh, high mortgages putting off buyers. Well, but Melanie, this is the problem. My daughters all say, gosh, rates are so high at the moment. Isn't anyone of my age will tell you they're not. This is just normal. What's happened is that rates have normalized after two significant events over the last two decades with the great financial crisis followed by the pandemic. Well, it will be putting buyers off. You're right, uh, Melanie, but uh, you can get deals. Um, the five-year deals are better than the two-year deals, mainly because the way the yield curve is um, slightly inverted when you look at here in the UK. This explains exactly why uh, with... Um, 
two year rates been higher than five year. That's why five year mortgages are cheaper than two year mortgages. Ha, Melanie, I remember my mortgage rate going up to 17% in the late 80s. Yeah, painful. And I remember jumping at the chance to fix my rates at 12%. 12% because I because I thought it was a good deal. I fixed it at 12% for two years. Wow. Yeah, and you tell my daughters that, my oldest daughter, when I said you need to stress test your mortgage and just see what happens when rates go to 5%. Don't be so silly. They're not going to go to 5%. This was like a couple of years ago, three years ago. Yeah, just goes to show you. Paul, uh, as we've said previously, it will never go back. It will probably level out three, three and a half percent. Yeah, I think at best, Paul, I, I, I think that's quite optimistic. I think uh, four, four and a half percent will be the norm uh, from, for for, um, for interest rates. Maybe maybe four percent, but mortgages could come down because you know they're they're not based on. Um, well, they're not based on the variable rate. They tend to, well, certainly the fixed rate deals, they're based on what you're looking at on the screen here. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so markets, tough old times, as I said. Um, so FTSE down 206, DAX 318 down. Uh, so that's what, 2.7, 2.1%. The Dow 540 down 1.6%. Um, S&P 100 points down 2.3%. The NASDAQ, as always, the one that sort of tends to, um, fall the most and rise the most. That was down um, uh, 400 points exactly. Uh, that's not the Nasdaq. That's the euro. Have I met? Oh, what's happened here? Uh, apologies about that. Gosh, don't know. Uh, it 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 yeah. It happens. It happens sometimes. Um, anyway, um, we were talking about all sorts of things. China, better um, better data in China. But that's that's what happens when you talk about China. Yeah. Um, anyway, those figures about uh, GDP were better than expected, five and a half percent. Retail sales better as well. Um, and I think it's sort of given a bit of a fillip to the world's second largest economy, which let's face it has really been struggling. Um, and you only have to look at the likes of the uh, Hang Seng. There we go. Tumbling again. Look at it today. Yeah, there's all sorts of talk going on at the moment. You've got this, um, you know, the, the, the big fallout really from the property and house building sector. And the reason why it's a big deal is that, gosh, up to sort of 35, sometimes 40% of the Chinese uh, economy is based on property and house building. So you can understand what uh, effects that sort of having. Um, Evergrande, you've, you've heard that name, um, has racked up debts of 340 billion over the past few years. Um, and there is absolutely no short-term solution to its problems uh, because when a company is having problems like that, it's normally down to the sector. Uh, and the property sector really is just struggling from uh, what's described as years of over expansion uh, and then country garden you've heard have you heard of that one that's the private house builder and that's likely to default on a tranche of its offshore bonds and that just affects the market even more anyway um, so china bright point with the the gdp data but the outlook still does not look brilliant and that really uh, you can see that in the um, hang saying the way that's fallen um, but that's falling in common with other indices. It just tends to fall further. In fact, the Hang Seng, what did that do last week? Yeah, it's about about 700 points down last week, so it's close to 4% compared to, you know, the S&P down 2.3%, 2, uh, 2 NASDAQ down 2.93%. So, uh, yeah, it, in context, it's... Um, uh, one of the bigger moves. Uh, anyway, yeah, here in the UK, yeah, um, inflation. We had inflation last week came in uh, unchanged um, from the previous month, although I think economists had expected a slight fall. And um, we have talked about this um, earlier on um, about um, um, Andrew Bailey and the inflation data, etc. I think, oh, and you mentioned it, didn't you? Um, Oil prices, yeah, having an effect, but actually, ironically, um, it's down to the um, uh, last it, last year's jump in energy prices. That sort of falls out the annual calculation. It's it's a bit complicated. It's referred to as the base effect. Anyway, it's good news for inflation watchers. 
um, but it did little help to, to help the markets, of course, with the FTSE shedding. Actually, it's one of the bigger fallers, down 2.7% last week. But that's obviously in the wake of the falls in the US and other global markets. And um, and some below expectation sales data, I think uh, we also had uh, last week. It was retail sales. Yeah, minus 0.9%, expected minus 0.3%. And I think there's a lot of seasonal issues that are affecting um, retail sales. Uh, on the dollar front, uh, the US dollar, um, uh, giving up a little bit of ground last week, um, a modest amount, and also the dollar falling a, li falling a little bit further at the moment. Interest rate expectations are the main reason. Um, if I quickly have a look at here, you can see what the Fed, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I need to keep that going and get another browser. Sorry, everything has gone a bit piton. I don't know why. I know it's something to do with a antivirus thing. It's scanning at the same time as it's trying to look for malware, which is really throwing a spanner in the works. Uh, anyway, the FedWatch tool is telling us that there's absolutely no chance of a rate hike at the meeting on the 1st of November. And if anything, it's shifted. Yeah, Monday morning blues. Monday morning black screen, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. So... Um, yeah, John. Yeah, learning is good. Yeah, that's that's excellent. Um, apologies. It doesn't. Know, I don't normally have a black screen appear on my computer, but there we go. Um, learning is good. Absolutely. Um, so 97.8 percent probability of no change in rates. A very very small possibility. They might even cut rates. But the key one at the end of December, where there was a 35 percent probability of a rate rise before the end of the year, that slipped back a lot. What is it now? 25%, isn't it? Um, yeah. So it could be a pause in the dollar's rise, because uh, last week, I don't know if you um, read the news, JP Morgan and Citibank expect the euro USD rate to fall to parity. So we're talking about one to one. When was the last time it was down at parity, for God's sake? Probably quite a while ago. Yeah. So anyway, that's what they are reckoning, um, but um, a little way to go just yet. Um, you know, it's JP, Mor JP Morgan and, and Citibank were those two, yeah. Uh, okay, let's have a look at the calendar, most important. There's my calendar. Um, yeah, it's a bit difficult with the uncertainty created by this Israeli-Hamas um, uh, conflict. Um, it is, when I say it's uncertain, we just don't know what, how it's going to progress. It's not like they're releasing data at 9.30 or 1.30 or whatever. Um, it, it's, it's just, you have to react or the markets will react to it, uh, you know, day by day. Um, but there are equally important known events for us to focus on, so let's have a look at those. Just remove the high, uh, low impact ones. Uh, okay, uh, nothing on Monday. No, no, absolutely nothing. Nothing worth talking about. Uh, clock changes back one hour Saturday and Sunday morning. Very good point. Very, very good point, which is what they'll talk about next week. But you're quite right. So uh, daylight uh, savings shift. We call it going from British summertime to British wintertime or GMT. Um, anyway, that happens on Sunday, whereas, let's go back a week. When does it happen in the US? It's a week after that, isn't it? It must be. When does the US shift its daylight? savings. Anyway, answers on a postcard. Um, okay, so uh, Tuesday, uh, we have all this uh, 
Um, so, uh, so UK claimant count. That's a very good point. So we've got the uh, uh, US, uh, sorry, UK unemployment data. It's called the claimant count. There is a sign of a softening in the employment market. So we'll wait and see what that data says. But 2.3, so 2,300 uh, new claims. Um, the trend. I think it's two weeks later. Is it okay? Yeah, that's interesting. I should have looked two weeks later. So basically, we'll have two weeks. Um, uh, of um, four-hour uh, difference between us and the U.S. Let me just check that. Yeah, so Sunday the 5th of November. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Michael. Um, so Sunday the 5th of November, so we've got two weeks where our clocks uh, f go back uh, one hour closer to the US, so the different differential is only five hour, uh, four hours, so uh, markets will open at um, half one, not half two, and all the major da data releases will come out at half 12, that normally come out at half one. Uh, but we'll explain a little bit more about that in uh, next week's workshop. Um, so uh, manufacturing and um, uh, services PMI data. PMI stands for Purchasing Managers Index. It's a way of measuring the health or the not very good health of the manufacturing and services sector. Uh, anything above 50 means that sector is expanding. Uh, anything below 50 means it's contracting. You will note that there's a modest uptick expected in some of the manufacturing numbers in both the Eurozone and in the UK, but actually it's only really modest, and it's still below uh, 50, uh, marred below 50. Uh, in fact, I've heard the description uh, with the uh, French um, manufacturing of 44.4, the German manufacturing of 40. This is, it's, it's pretty dire. It's marred and dire. Uh, yeah. No, no problem. Uh, no problem. It's one week difference, is it? Yeah. Okay, so is it ours at the end of, um, yeah, okay, that's a good point. We jumped ahead one week. One week for the UK and two weeks for the US, so it's a one week difference, you're quite right. Um, so that's the flash manufacturing and services sector. Yeah, the economy is split into two sectors, really. Manufacturing tends to be quite small, especially here in the UK. It's only about 20% of GDP. Um, services about 80% here. In the US, manufacturing is, is a bigger deal, but uh, the service sector is still by far and away the largest sector there. Same in, in the Eurozone, especially in, in the likes of Germany, which has uh, seen its manufacturing uh, sector absolutely implode with China slowing down and uh, the effect of the uh, spike in um, energy prices, especially gas, which they used to get from uh, Russia. Uh, okay, what's next after that? Wednesday, we got our first, uh, our only, is it our only, uh, no, sorry, it's one of two. What am I talking about? Uh, Bank of Canada policy decision. Um, this is their monthly meeting, policy meeting. As you can see, they're keeping rates unchanged at 5%. Um, you know, and, and all these central banks are saying the same thing. They're saying that, you know, they're, they're open to raising rates if it's appropriate. And of course, they're open to raising rates or lowering rates if it's appropriate, because that's what their job is. But I think in common with other uh, central banks, the Bank of Canada is deciding to pause uh, while the effects of previous rate hikes um, take effect, which is entirely appropriate. Um, but I think um, you're going to hear that a lot from uh, US um, decision makers on the FOMC, Bank of England decision makers as well. Uh, anyway, the Canadian dollar will be particularly sensitive to that, so just remember that, bear that in mind uh, on um, Wednesday afternoon. And then there's the press conference at 4 o'clock, which could be interesting. Uh, Christine Lagarde, chairperson or chair of the European Central Bank, is talking Wednesday evening. She's speaking at a bank uh, dinner uh, hosted by the Bank of Greece in Greece. Um, could be interesting, especially ahead of uh, the rate decision for the uh, Eurozone the following day, which is next on my agenda. So uh, the main refi rate expected to be left unchanged at four and a half percent. No change. Yeah, that's uh, same as last month. Um, and I think really with what's happening with the Middle East conflict, it really adds uncertainty about economic activity. And having 
shown you what's going on in the Eurozone with regards to manufacturing and service sector data, you can understand why uh, the European Central Bank will want to pause their um, uh, rate rising um, cycle. And it's possible that we're, we're close to the end or at the end uh, in the Eurozone and possibly in the UK, possibly. Um, US, we've then got uh, GDP uh, data was that advanced GDP data. So this is the third quarter, which is from July through to the end of September, June, July, August, September. Always extraordinary they can get a number out by the 20th or the 23rd or whatever it is, the 26th of the month, um, which is a, a measure of the output from the whole US economy. Anyway, they've only got about 40% of the data. Out. This is the very first reading. Um, there are four readings. It's before the prelim data one. It's called the advanced. 4.3%. That's why the, you know, um, U.S. Federal Reserve, the Rate Setting Committee, the FOMC, have got a bit of a headache because it's got a particularly strong economy, far stronger economy in the U.S. than there is anything to be seen here in Europe uh, or in the eurozone. Uh, we're in a different, a diff we're in a different lower league. That is for sure. For now. No, yeah, yeah. Uh, we then have a press conference at 145, which should be quite interesting on Thursday, just to get a take on what, why they took the decision that they took, and also give us a bit of a clue as to any further moves um, in the coming months. Uh, and then uh, towards the end of the week, or on Friday, it is the end of the week, we have the favoured um, uh, personal consumption expenditure. This is another measure of inflation. Um, we're expecting a, a slight pickup from plus 0.1 to plus 0.3%. This is the one that the Federal Reserve use. They tend to, tend to put more weight in this than the one from there, a statistical department that produces the regular CPI data. Um, anyway, that's coming out at uh, 1.30 on a Friday evening. And then the very last number, uh, which now I'm glad to see is given a high impact reading. It never used to. Uh, revised University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment. What's weird is that they always put a revision out, and the revision is never anything different than the original number. Anyway, it just goes to underline actually how important consumer center sentiment is in gauging future economic activity. Happy consumers spend more money. They spend more money wherever they're spending their money on those companies that are providing those goods and services. They'll do better. Yeah. That's, that's the way it works. Uh, anyway, well, listen, thanks for listening. I apologize about the glitch in the middle of that presentation. I hope it didn't disturb things too much. And thank you, Stuart, for stepping in. Um, um, I won't be here next Monday. Uh, Stuart already knows about that, so he'll have to do the whole session. Um, I'll be returning from the Rugby World Cup. Sadly, I won't be watching England. It was close, but no cigar. No problem, Chris. All the best. Um, you have a good rest of the week. Uh, and to you all, please, Michael, uh, Bruce, John, uh, Melanie, have a great rest of the week. And, and thanks for your patience and understanding with my glitch. Yeah, all the best and, and bye for now.